Thanks for checking out the Blowout Podcast. If you're looking for genuine perspectives throughout the world of sports, without the bias that comes from a national media outlet, well, you've come to the right place. I'm your host, Ty Schwartzlow, but before we kick things off, we need a quick pep talk from Coach Bill Yost. I don't want him to gain another yard. You blitz all night! Now we're in the right frame of mind. If you don't find that exciting, do me a favor, check your pulse. Hello again and welcome to another edition of the Blowout Podcast. I am your host, Ty Schwartzlow, joined today by local journalist and uh, sports buzz panelist, Jeff Tice. But before we get started, uh, I've got to be a little egocentric and take my opening say. Jeff Tice will uh, certainly provide any insight that he has, uh, but as I was the one that prepared it, I, I assume it's probably going to be myself. And I want to start off with saying that I love football. I love American football. I always have, and um, I played it throughout high school. haven't played it since uh, my senior year, and since then I've I've noticed a few disturbing things throughout the game of American football. And it it is America's new pastime. It's the most popular sport in our country, it goes without saying. But uh, for the first time in my life this past weekend, I pushed American football to the back burner in favor of international football. This Saturday, uh, whether it was the Germany-France game in the World Cup or uh, the Netherlands uh, penalty kick uh, advancement mm-hmm. into the semifinals, it was a fantastic day of sports, Jeff. I'd say it is. it was the best day of sports all summer. Would you agree or disagree with that well, statement? Well, I, I was having a time of my life watching the NBA draft. But it was, in terms of, yeah, that was a pretty exciting day. They, they were... They, they, the one thing you can say about the World Cup, other than a few of the matches, they're always close and competitive. So they're the, that U.S. game against Belgium the other day, it was that was that was pretty intense. And you thought they were out of it, and then bang, they scored a goal. And it's like, oh no, they have a chance now. But yeah, when it's that low scoring and that those great of players, it's always going to be a, a good match to watch. Well, the thing I really like about international football in comparison to American football is just. It's almost like it's got a life to it. A soccer match, it only takes uh, just over two hours at most, and it really does have a life. You don't have the commercial break, you don't have the huddle, whereas the NFL, you're literally waiting 40 seconds for a six-second burst. It's two totally different uh, styles, and I've certainly been begun to appreciate the value. I was certainly one of the ugly Americans who dismissed <laughs> soccer. Have you come around on, on international football at all? Well... I'm I'm not against watching it. I'll watch it if if I de- if if I just come across it and watch it. I'll do it. But am I going to openly choose to like? I wasn't like making appointment viewing for the World Cup. Like I try like when I know we were going to talk about it, and I know we'd I'd like catch some of the U.S. and catch the highlights and catch the talk just to know at least what I'm talking about, or at least kind of know what I'm talking about. But yeah, in terms of like just an over the overall game, like yeah. It's very friendly in terms of time, and you don't feel like you're wasting it, so to speak. Like, I can't tell you how mad I get when it's like, touchdown, uh, commercial, go to kickoff, commercial. <laughs> well, it's Paul it, had it, brought it up on the Sports Buzz. He's got the Red Zone Network, but unless you watch the NFL with the Red Zone Network or you DVR games... Uh, you're not getting that full experience. Oh, the Red Zone Network is terrific. It is terrific, but think about the NFL without that and going back to the old way of watching games through commercials. You just get one game at a time, and here we have this international football where we're the only country that this isn't the main ticket, the main event. It's just interesting, and uh, you've got these people who are going to go to bat for American football, and whether it's the flopping uh, or the fact that the same physical sacrifice isn't being made in the international game. Uh, every sport has its deficiencies, and to harp on soccer is, is to make yourself believe that American football is superior is really nothing more than cognitive dissonance, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I, I don't see the reason to hate on it. If it's not your thing, it's not your thing. But to just put it down in terms of what you think about it, it's okay. There, people have their own things. And it's... It, um, Soccer's coming along a lot better here than I would say American football is in other countries. <laughs> That's a good point. So, you were like, we're trying to get American football in like London and whatever, and having yeah. a couple games there a year, and it's like, well, okay. And but, and, and with the World Cup, they've really uh, taken hold of. I think this month I had said that this Saturday was uh, my favorite viewing event. Certainly, the NBA draft has uh, some redeeming qualities, but I really enjoyed. Saturday, and I've always personally taken pride in the fact that I can admit when I'm wrong. And I used to hold the ugly American perspective of American football, physical sacrifice, and international football just can't match it. Well, I was wrong. There's a lot to uh, be taken from 
these international football matches, whether it's World Cup, Premier League, but uh, I think any sport at its highest level certainly has some entertainment value. And, uh, Jeff, before we segue into what I guess you're a little more excited about, the NBA, uh, any any final thoughts on this World Cup and your uh, excitement going forward this week or not well, appointment viewing for you? It's not appointment viewing. I've got... I, I don't know. It's just if if I come across it, I'll watch it. I'll probably try to watch the final, but yeah, I, I can't complain about the the viewing aspect of it. It's just in terms of its popularity, I'd like to see how it get, goes past the World Cup and if more people like the if more people get into the English Premier League and stuff like that. Like over the last four years, I noticed like just on Twitter and people I follow are just trying to get more into it, but. We'll see how that goes. It certainly is uh, something I'm very curious to see how it moves forward, whether it's the success of the MLS, maybe some American players going overseas to play in some of the elite leagues. Uh, But the elite league that we've got here is uh, the NBA, and they're off the court for the moment. uh, uh, But NBA free agency is in full swing. And, Jeff, uh, we're going to open it up very open-ended. How much do you really care at this point? I care a lot in, ter- in terms of the N- just the NBA. Uh, like and the free agency. How much do you care about LeBron going to visit? Carmelo being wooed ter- by in whoever? Terms of, in terms of, like, where they're being... It's, Until it's they hit, actually switch teams, hit, how much do you care? It's hit, it's hit and miss. Like, LeBron, like, Carmelo being a leader with the Lakers the other day, that kind of was like... I was kind of mixed on them. Like, what are the Lakers doing? And... And then it was funny. It's like Carmelo's rationale for it. it's like, oh, they could pay me the backs without doing anything to the roster. I'm like, well, they don't have a roster. That's, that's <laughs> you're just get it's. Is it about the money or is it about the winning? I think is uh, uh, with Carmelo. And for me, the fatigue it comes up a little quicker than it sounds like for you because of the fact that I don't care if you're going on visits. Tell me when you're changing teams. If you're in their position, what do you think? It, we'll start with Carmelo. What do you think is the best choice for him to stay in New York or go? It elsewhere? depends what you want to do. Like if. If he wants to win, like I'll, I'm going to bring this all around to the with the Lakers and how it drives me up the wall. <laughs> well, the, like if you want to win, you got to and you're a star. Even though it's a it's a broke it's a pretty flawed system. You got to take less money in terms of you can't like if what was it four years ninety some million or whatever twenty three twenty four million dollars a year, which is you know, which is great. But if you want to if you want to win, you gotta you gotta do what the the Heat did four years ago, where LeBron, Wade, and Bosh, all in their prime, said, "All right, we're going to take a little less so we can make this work and have some cap room and, and whatnot." And then they ended up going to four straight finals. But I don't think Carmelo's openly going, "I want to win, I want to win." I think he, I think his stat, his his thing is, "I want to win," but you guys have to build around me and, and what I have. And I'm like, that's not, a, that's not a bad idea because it's like Carmelo at this point, he's at the end of his prime. He's got, a, I would say, a year or two of his best play left before he starts to no somewhat doubt. decline. But, like, Kobe Bryant took the opposite approach last year when he re-upped after his injury. That He said that he want, his goal, his, he said his sole purpose now is to win titles, but then you make, you're like the highest paid player in the league and taking yeah. up 40% of your team's cap. I, I think Kobe's got to be taking a pay cut there. And but he's not going to. Yeah, he should. Like, like compared to his contemporaries in, like, Tim Duncan's making $10 million. He just opted in for $10 million. The One of my favorite stats I heard was that Duncan, Parker, and Ginobili made less than Kobe Bryant last year. Wow, so, for the X amount of games yeah. that Bryant was actually on the floor. What amount of... Uh, I'm a little skeptical of Carmelo going to Miami for a couple of reasons, one being the financial part of it, but say they were all to take pay cuts. How do you think that works with Carmelo Anthony, Dwayne Wade, Chris Bosh, and LeBron James on the same floor together? It's, I don't know. Like, Wade's, Wade was such, was off in the finals. And, like, sometimes guys just don't match. Like, you need, you need to define roles. Like you can't have like you can't put together five superstars and expect them to be something. Like you're better off with a, a better role player than Luol you would. Deng. And, and yeah, like I think Luol Deng would be a bunch better fit than Carmelo. Even though Carmelo is a better player, it's like you need to you need to have roles and 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 whatnot. But you can't just jam a bunch of superstars together and expect it to work. Like kind of what the Lakers did a few years ago with well Steve Nash was last his last year with the Suns is his mm-hmm. last best year and then then they brought Dwight Howard in and they had Powell and they had Kobe and but it didn't work because 
the system they had where they couldn't have Powell and Dwight Howard together, and Kobe Bryant was still taking was still chucking, so you it wasn't gonna work. And then they finally kind of figured it out towards the end, but then Kobe got hurt and. Well, it. I just kind of lost my train of thought as I just <laughs> regained it now. Uh, it seems to me like it's safe to say, at least I'm going to assume, LeBron is going to be in Miami for one more year. Like that with uh, with the contracts, we'll just assume, I guess, for the moment that he is going to stay for one well, more year. Why do you think one more year? Well, just because of the fact that you need to see exactly what uh, what Dwayne Wade's status is. He's a premier player in the league, but after this past season, I wouldn't blame him for going elsewhere, but is he really going to find a better supporting cast than he has in Miami? Um, I think he can he, he could go to cleveland they really got, well the thing with people some people are forgetting with cleveland is they can sign lebron and okay. then they'd have lebron kyrie irving and then and then the the, the wild card and all this is the, the Cavs are trying to trade for kevin love with the number one pick and kevin love said he'd re-up with the Cavs if lebron was there and i guarantee you flip saunders would be like andrew wiggins and whatever for kevin love they I, the wolves i guarantee as a wolves that. fan you want andrew wiggins for I, love. I, gar- I, I, I guarantee right? the, i guarantee flip saunders would do that okay so so and kevin love would re-up with the Cavs if lebron was there and they got kyrie irving so that's a very very plausible play here in the words of Lou Brown, that's a hell of an idea. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 very on the table, and that would and that would be and that's exactly what the Wolves would want. And like, and don't the, love is close, or I wouldn't say I don't know close, but he knows Kyrie Irving. They've they've shot commercials together. But, <laughs> For what that uh, is worth. But yeah, they in love in love said they they it was reported that if he was traded to the Cavs and LeBron was there, he would definitely resign with them. So. Well, I mean, it's clearly all the focus has been on uh, LeBron James and Carmelo Anthony, and I guess what I should say correctly, if they stay put where they are, I think you see some of the power go to a Paul Gasol, go to a Luol Deng, because all of a sudden they are the premier players on the market. I I agree. They get it's just LeBron has LeBron, and then Carmelo have to do their thing first before it's the a domino. domino before the dominoes to fall because the only guys that are resigned are Kyrie Irving resigned his thing is uh, uh max deal with the Cavs but he Kyle wasn't Lowry. a free agent Kyle Lowry was I thought he was going to go to the Heat but or the Rockets but it, it seems to me like his agent just played the media and got mm-hmm. l- squeezed a little more money by using but, that but that was a good con- that was a good contract for I think for both sides Kyrie uh, Lowry got paid and that was a that's a, like Toronto, you might have to pay a couple extra million more a year to, to get a guy in, but the guy's a good player. But yeah, in terms of, uh, yeah, one, yeah, who else resigned? Like Boris Diaw resigned. Well, and, it's and not a lot of big Dirk names. Resigned, but it, and I think if you're looking for the storyline, it certainly begins and ends with uh, the, the big three, I guess, mm-hmm. of this offseason Melo, LeBron, and Kevin Love. As a Wolves fan, do you want to see Kevin Love in a Wolves uniform on opening night? If they if they're able to resign him, which is impossible, but so if they're going to lose him, you'd like for them to trade and well, get some value back. It's going to be a disaster <laughs> if if he's on the like. I I understand his situation. If you don't want to, he doesn't want to be here, and I don't blame him. But but the but well, the way he's handled this has been kind of not the best for the fans, and they're gonna they're gonna boo him out, out of the stadium. At this point, him. isn't it best to just cut your losses, get what you can back, and move forward and get this whole ordeal the, behind you? I don't know why they didn't trade him before the draft because the longer they wait on this, it's gonna be tougher to get like the best value on him. Like there's a report the Celtics are still trying to do something and. I, I don't know what Flip Saunders is looking for, but well, yeah. we had we had talked on the sports buzz about uh, the Levine Levine mm-hmm. pick, however you want to choose to pronounce it, and he wasn't too happy with going to Minnesota. And one of the things that you had mentioned mm-hmm. was he's young, he's got time. Paul even had mm-hmm. mentioned uh, Ricky Rubio mm-hmm. didn't like Minnesota. I think the difference here with the Kevin Love situation is he's been in Minnesota mm-hmm. for a few years. It's clear he does not want to stay. I think you're fooling yourself mm-hmm. if you think you're going to be able it's, to resign him. It's just yeah, I mentioned this too. Like Paul mentioned somewhere. The, the the small market teams are gonna have trouble have trouble re-signing free or free agents and I'm like well that's kind of false because if you're if you're a well-run small market team you can re-sign guys if look at OKC o- Oklahoma City yeah they they've well, they've made some questionable decisions in terms of trading James Harden and whatnot but they've like the Spurs come to mind they've been a, they've been gr- good forever and like the what Kevin Love looks at with the Wolves is it's like in his whole time here they've been run poorly and it's like I might as well go somewhere like he wants to go to Los Angeles like if he were a free agent this year he would have already signed with the Lakers and he would have you think so? 
yeah, he was like, screw LeBron and screw Carmelo. I'm signing with the Lakers. And it's just if he's going to, like, the Lakers aren't the best-run organization either. But yeah. it's like at least he's at he's in a place he wants to be and whatnot. But yeah, you certainly can't yeah. begrudge uh, the professional athlete for, you know, they've earned the right. He's spent X amount of years in Minnesota, so it certainly is his choice. However, as a, a putting myself in the position of a Timberwolves fan, I want people who want to be in Minnesota, mm-hmm. who want to play in front of me, and whether it's Levine, Levine, I think it's, Love. I think it's funny, like, in terms of Minnesota, people view it in basketball terms as a place just, nope, don't want to go there. But then, <laughs> but then hockey, it's like, the, the the wild just signed yeah. Thomas Vanek and the, I, a couple years ago they had Parisi and Suter and it's like it's kind of a destination like and it's it's kind of it's kind of weird but yeah in terms of I think Minnesota will be more attractive if they run better but my opinion is if uh, I don't know I, I I like that Glenn Taylor wants to keep the team here but other than that is uh, how he own, how he's ran the team is just. Like when they hired Flip Saunders, he might be the guy for the job, but the way they the way he hired him, it's like let's fire David Kahn, yeah. and then instead of going through a hiring process of bringing somebody up, it's like nope, bringing in Flip, bringing him in, and it's it's like what kind of what kind of uh, what other team would do that? I, I don't I don't know. Yeah, you can hear from the tone of your voice that you don't have to be a Timberwolves fan to understand the frustration that uh, mm-hmm. Mr. Jeff Tice and fellow Timberwolves fans are, are going through. Uh, like I, I think I, at least in my opinion, summed it up best. Uh, just get this whole ordeal behind yeah, you. Yeah, it's just gotta it, get it done. It's it just no fun to talk about. As Justin Barrientos, another Timberwolves fan, uh, sneaks into the room. We know that he is uh, very ready to put the Kevin Love situation <laughs> behind him. So, taking his cue, we will uh, do that and move towards Major League Baseball and a, a huge trade over the weekend. I don't know about you, Jeff, but the uh, trade hot stove league certainly in the regular oh. season. One of my favorite things to analyze. A's, Cubs, Jeff Samarja trade, who wins? Your instant reaction. Who won? Like, right now, it's the A's because they're the best team in baseball, and then they got they got a stronger in their starting rotation, and they're not looking for they're not looking for three, four years from now in terms of, like, because I, I don't think Jeff Samarja is going to be on the A's in two years. It's either they're going to deal him or just going to ride it out with him. But in terms of this year, it, it helps them a lot. And in terms of the Cubs – it just makes their minor league system even stronger and it's like if you're not going to be good like the cubs are right now they're in a in my opinion the toughest division in baseball mm-hmm. you, they're just loading up on young players and and whatnot and they're just trying to make a go go with it so they get a top according to espn top five prospect and to already go with their top how many and i'm trying to think of major league baseball the depth in their league. infield is absurd yeah, i was looking the, at it this morning you put if russell can stick at shortstop you maybe move Baez to second base you've got the power of chris bryant mm-hmm. at third hey there's this anthony rizzo already at first mm-hmm. base and uh, they've got outfield prospects I, I guess to segue it in jeff are they the best minor league farm system in the league i would say yes now like it was between them and boston before and boston's was i don't know i it, I don't want to say overrated, but it's just I just looked at some of the prospects and I'm like, yeah, they're okay, but we'll see how it, it ends up. Like the Cubs have a little more have more impact players in their system. It looks like like Chris Bryant. I think I don't know who he's. Yeah, he wasn't like when I looked a, a couple weeks ago for this topic on the show. We we're like, should they trade some margins? So I'm like, let's look at their farm system and. Bryant wasn't rate their number one rated prospect. I'm like, why? <laughs> Dude can hit. It, and watching some highlights, you uh, aren't kidding. Yeah, and he was number two overall pick last, last year. year. Yeah, so Duke can play. And but yeah, and t- I, I I loved Oakland before, and it's just more fun to watch. It's gonna be more fun to watch him now. And for me, it brings back memories of the CC Sabathia trade. You have an organization uh, that's just been very close, right around the corner from maybe uh, making that final push and. Maybe the difference is a uh, Jeff Samarjan. Mm-hmm. There's also Jason Hamill in that deal. Yeah. You look at their starting rotation, at, at least in terms of ERA. I know you're a sabermetric guy. Yeah, mm-hmm. I am. <sighs> ERA, uh, their lowest ranked pitcher, I believe, is 35th in the majors, not just the AL. So their rotation yeah. is second to none at this point. I, I agree with you, but yeah, that's 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 the thing. I I, I don't 
I don't get I get kind of I don't get bent out of shape anymore. Where people, I, at least somebody when they traded for Jeff Smarger the other day, they didn't go. He's two and seven. At least nobody said that. That would have that would have drove me up the wall. All right, but, no, we need to take a second here. Why is the win? Is it the most overrated statistic in base, baseball? There are some things in baseball like. <sighs> Why is the win overrated? We don't need to go. It's, on, it, why it, is it overrated? Because you can go eight innings and give up an unearned run and lose the game, or you can go five innings, give up six runs and win the game, or you can relievers can blow the save and get the win. And it's what, it's, what is uh, to some of the old school baseball people who look at a pitcher's mm-hmm. win loss record as the first thing. What's the first thing you look at for a successful pitcher? I look at. Like I combine, I look at their ERA and I look at their WHIP, their walks and hits, innings pitch, and if that's good, like not with like with a reliever, you have to look at it differently. Like, because when do they enter games? How many inherited runners do they let score? Blah blah. blah. But in terms of starters, their ERA, their WHIP, and then their strike, they're, they're kind of their strikeout rate, just to see, just to see what kind of like how dominant they are and whatnot. So like, you're still for some of these old school statistics. You just think it can be better accentuated yeah, with it, some of these saber metrics. Like, Yes, in terms like people take like on TV, people take win loss record way too seriously. I watch the Twins every day, and it may it drives me nuts. So a lot of things drive me nuts about baseball, but that and then another one is the save, like because if there were no save stats, the closers would be used a lot differently. Like we have we have situations now where guys go like. There was one situation last year where Araldus Chapman went like 11 games without pitching, and I'm like, if there was no save stat, that would not happen. No, and, there's no way. Yeah, so, and, like, pitchers would be used differently. Like, hey, it's the seventh inning, you got guys on first and second with a one out, and you have a one-run lead, bring in your best guy. And Why then not? It's like, I'd rather have my best guy in there than some middle reliever. And then they're like, well, what about the ninth inning? It's like, well... So do you think we should just get rid of the save altogether or maybe rewrite... It's not going to happen. It's kind of a it's good talking point, but... but not much uh, in terms of action it, and a solution. It's just, yeah, there, there's some managers that are more progressive. I, well, I hate to say we're progressive because it's like, it seems just more logical. Like Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to go... But, yeah, I, but yeah, I'll just leave it at that. The save, the save is what it is, but there, there are ways that guys could use, be used better. And we talked about the Twins lineup on the show the other day, and Ron Gardenhier drives me nuts every week with how he puts out the Twins lineup. Well, I, I want to – glad you did bring up the Twins. We talked about the Cubs. They probably have the best farm system in baseball. How would you compare the Twins uh, uh, to that? I know they have Buxton and Sano injured, but how, how do you like well, their farm the system? they're in the top five because, yeah, Buxton and Sano are going to be – as long as their injuries turn out by They'll be impact players and, like, not only that, elite players. And they have – they have some good pitching like Alex Meyer. He'll he's supposed to be, you know, pretty good. He's now he's they, had he's had some good numbers in the minors. I don't know why he's not up yet, but <laughs> he it's he's not he's he's what, twenty five now? Twenty four, twenty five well, now. Uh, I yeah, I guess questions about uh signability mm-hmm. in the extra year certainly uh, come out of out but, of uh, the talking terms point. Of, in terms of your question the they're they're a top farm system just on just on their the impact talent they have down there that, that can they can do that but they're going down there they got the their their farm system's gotten a heck of a lot better over the last like three four years it's pretty clear that the twins uh pinnacle here is going to be in the future and certainly not this season but at the same time they find themselves in a a very tight al central race what value do you think they can get through the second half of the season maybe not making the playoffs but playing in valuable games and getting that uh oh. game mentality do you put any any credence to that or well, no? game by game that's it's looking worse for them because they're 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 losing ground if, if they if they can hang around and just get I some think, of these young guys i think they can hang around it's just that they gotta they gotta they gotta make some changes in terms of like they signed kendris morales which i thought was fine because it's like hey we're we're looking to get better this season and it was a one-year deal, and then all of a sudden it's like, well, they're still throwing out like they have the worst starting rotation in terms of ERA in the in the league, and it's like you're throwing like Ricky Nolasco pitched yesterday, he was bad, but you can't do anything about him. You got to keep him in the rotation because well, at least for now they're the they're, Jeff Supon corollary. Yeah, Jeff Supon. I, I actually liked Supon, but <laughs> <laughs> you don't you are on the edge of being mm-hmm. kicked off of this podcast. <laughs> Jeff Supon is the devil. But yeah, and. 
Yeah, when he was with Dave Duncan, he was all right. But with uh, a lot of pitchers <laughs> with Dave Duncan, be all right. But, but yeah, no, but Nolasco has been just bad this year, and there's talk about moving him to the bullpen. But I'm like, well, if, unless they call up the the good pitchers, I I, I don't see if it what's, makes a difference. What's but, the alternative? But they got Alex Meyer and Trevor May have to be in the rotation if they want to say we're competing this year. But I think they're gonna wait till after the All Star break to do anything. I think I don't think they want the I, I don't know what they're thinking. <laughs> I mean, uh, as a fan, are you maybe... Obviously, you're looking at the scoreboard, the win-loss, but you're not so much focused on the standings as maybe the individual development? Like, in, like in, in terms of individual development, like, I, I look at their players that will be on the team years from now. Like, Buxton and Snow haven't played a game yet. Who's a guy in the Major League roster Man, that you see Brian, five years from now as being a staple of I this organization? I can see Brian Dozier still on the team, and he's been playing well. Oswaldo Arce has struggled. That's it, uh, it's like he he does he can't lay off the breaking ball in the dirt. He can't hit a he can't hit a fastball consistently. But he's a young player and he mashed in the minors. I think it has just more of getting used to uh, getting used to at the major league level. But Aaron Hicks was sent back down. Just and in terms of young pitchers, Kyle Gibson's looked nice. He, he's he's been solid. He looks like he could be a solid four or five for you in the future and uh who else has played there joe mauer is going to be there and uh, mm-hmm. yeah we've, we've talked about that on the sports buzz and uh, you get the sense uh, of whether it's the timberwolves or the twins just maybe brighter times around the corner for uh, some of the minnesota well, I, I think the twins are going to be fine it's just that it's just Oh, I, I just hope they know what they're doing. They, they got they got more talent now. In a couple of years, it should be a lot better. Well, but. speaking of knowing what you're doing, we are going to talk about the NFL very briefly and uh, news over the weekend about Johnny Manziel. Uh, well, it's not really worth even mentioning the details. Jeff, I want to ask you, as a Vikings fan, how glad are you that uh, Teddy Bridgewater is your franchise quarterback as opposed to Johnny Manziel? See, I wanted Manziel, uh, but at first about Manziel, I was – like I was kind of like people are overreacting to what he's doing, but since he was drafted, it's every weekend. There's like, a lack of self awareness. He's been like partying every weekend in a new spot. I'm like, I used to party that often too, but it's like, well, it was when I had nothing going on exactly. and, and whatever. It's like it's like you're quarterback, dude. You're pro football quarterback. <laughs> it's like at least have. It's like I once in a while going to Vegas ain't a bad thing, but. Every weekend, just getting drunk and partying it up. Well, it's like, to me, what you want to do with your free time is is just fine. It's just have the self awareness yeah. to realize that there's going to be somebody in the bathroom with a mm. camera phone. We're, we live in the age where yeah. you are too public of a figure to not realize that you're a public figure. Oh man, I, I, that's I don't more know. than enough talk on the NFL. Yeah, I'm, I'm done with off. I'm done with this. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I talked about it at the beginning. This is the time of year where the NFL is just truly in a dead period and. Uh, one of the comments I'll, I'll leave with this uh, to the Johnny Manziel article was, and Teddy Bridgewater was in his room studying his playbook, like a rookie quarterback should be, you know, just trying to get better as a football player, and uh, hopefully he can make Viking, give Minnesota sports fans something to smile about as uh, we segue into, uh, I guess for an American, not too uh, happy of a topic, but Jeff, how much uh, since the United States elimination, how much, I know we talked about the World Cup a little bit, how much have you been following the World Cup? Um, to be honest, it's hit and miss. Like, I'll, I know wins and loses and whatnot, but it's not appointment viewing. But, yeah, I, the Team USA thing was interesting in terms of how many people got behind it. I was I yeah. was really surprised. Like, people gathering in droves in cities to watch it. and It's gaining momentum in the yeah. States, is it not? Yeah, it, it is. It, but I think it, I'm, I, I don't know if it's soccer, if it's more patriotism, or... Hey, it's Wednesday at one o'clock. I don't want to work. Yeah. I don't know, but it, it's there's some kind of movement there. It just it all depends. Like I'm curious to see where it goes. Like in terms of once the World Cup's over, and like but MLS is growing. I heard that Minneapolis is trying to get a team, but it's growing sh- slowly but surely. You can't expect it to have this big boom and never. It's got to develop a fan base and, and just develop more of a base than anything in terms of just hoping it explodes to the top. I don't think it'll be as popular as like the, like in, in the United States as like the NBA or 
football oh, that, or college that, football. Or certainly football. a long ways away and uh, something to strive for, I guess, if nothing else. Uh, but, well, we're finishing up, uh, in, again, this is kind of a dead period throughout the world of sports as we're about the, at about the half-hour mark in our final uh topic here today is uh, the major league baseball all-star game your gut reactions upon having seen the rosters didn't really have any i i was i like i know there's some there like i still i used to care about this a lot when i was younger and i was like oh how could that guy get voted in or how could this guy be left off but now it's like well i'm gonna not care about it the wednesday after the all-star game so but yeah i was i was happy that the in terms of things i was happy about I was happy. I was happy to see Carlos Gomez as a starter. I was. Yeah. I was. Was there any doubt though? Um, I, I don't know. I just, I wasn't paying too much attention to the voting. But right then it's like Carlos clearly. Gomez is a starter. This is great. So. And he deserved to be. And it's like I don't know. I, I who's the? Oh well, yeah. Um, Puig is in right uh, for the National League outfield is loaded. Yeah, the National League looked a lot better than the American League, but the American League did have, look solid, oh, too. The, pi- the pitching in the American League uh, with Tanaka <laughs> and the rest of the crew, certainly, uh, obviously, it's going to be a great all-star game. But uh, Brian Dozier, we've talked about him a little bit, certainly with the depth at second base. No surprise uh, not to see him in, but Kurt Suzuki making an appearance. Uh, uh, deserving, you'd say, uh, having well, seen him just play? Look, just looking at the other catchers, it's like he's been good this year, but if, if I – I would have just been looking through tunnel vision at the twins only and what I've seen from, from other catchers or what I've known about other catchers. I've been like, well, it might be borderline, but just other catchers have been hurt or just not played well or whatever. And it's like, yeah, just uh, looking at his numbers just for this, the lens of this year, it's he deserves to be there. And I'll say I'm shocked. I didn't think he was going to be – I thought he, had been, he was going to be serviceable, but he, I didn't think he would be much at the plate because – the last four last four years, he had an on base of under three hundred, and I'm like, okay, and I, I wasn't expecting a whole lot. <laughs> All right, well, we will continue the baseball theme, and you knew we had to talk about it. the uh, The fantasy power play sports buzz, whatever you want to give it, uh, we've given it the unique title of Jeff Tice's reliable disappointment. Is this the worst fantasy league you've ever been a part of? Yes, it's. Inter- I'm just getting bludgeoned every week, and I. I I wish I picked if if I had to do it over again, I would have picked a better catcher to start. Well, yeah. But in terms of like, I would have probably picked Carlos Gomez instead of he would Jose be the Bautista. MVP of this league. It drives yeah, me. Yeah, I would have been picked Carlos Gomez instead of Jose Bautista because then and then I would have. It's like I like Josh Donaldson, and I think he's a great player, but he's just like he was doing very well and then i picked him and then it's just like he had a couple weeks where he didn't do anything now he's hitting better but yeah and my pitchers i can't complain it's just that glenn perkins he only pitched three days in a row and then he won't pitch for a week yeah well you you've been having lost the first game you were just completely at a disadvantage (laughs) as you had a man down we've worked out the rules of this but uh if you have no idea what in the world we are talking about tune into the sports buzz on hbc Every Wednesday at 5.30. And it's it, appointment viewing. That is appointment viewing, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, if you'd like to be up to speed on Jeff Tice's memorable fantasy season, go to hbci.com backslash sports and uh, look up Jeff Tice's reliable disappointment. <laughs> Worth a view. And uh, my walk-off question this week, Jeff, who is the most dominant high school athlete you have ever seen in person? In person? Oh, man. I, cause... <sighs> is Alec Brown in that conversation? Yes. He is. I'm trying to think. I'm going over sports and genders, and I'm like, who is just Well, while, while you're thinking about that, I'll tell you where the reasoning for this question came from. Okay. We're, uh, we're having Lake City basketball and, and looking over some of the uh, players that are coming in. Brady Kahinka, sophomore uh, last year, came back from an injury, and I was looking over his highlight tape. 15 minutes uh, of really unbelievable stuff, and considering he was an underclassman, he was the best player on the floor in a number of different areas. And like I said, coming off of an injury, it got me thinking, you know, who who dominates at the high school level uh, uh, similar to that? And going forward, certainly some office banter. I think that Kahinka would certainly be in the HBC viewing area, a yeah. potential athlete of the year. So uh, who, who uh, I stalled for a little while. Who do, Who's most dominant, Alec Brown maybe? Yeah, I would say uh, Alec Brown was the most game-changing athlete I probably saw or covered like I'm trying to think of my high school days but nobody really came to mind but yeah there Alec Brown had to been it because yeah he he was 
He could do it all from the size. He, yeah, was that he, the biggest he, weapon he had? He was. He was a. He made their defense spectacular. Like they they normally play a good zone defense, like the Windhawks do anyway, even when they don't have you know a really big guy inside. But he just he took away everything around the rim, and the opponents just couldn't score against it. And offensively, he was so big and he could shoot. And yeah, he just changed the game for everybody. I was. I'm trying to think of like. Baseball player, probably not nobody that comes to mind. Football, well, and uh, I saw uh, in high school, Carl Klug was a freaking beast, and I saw him play a couple times. And like, uh, they played Cotter one year, and it was uh, the to go to state, and the, the guys I knew on I wasn't on the team, but the guys I knew on the team were just scared to death of him. Oh, and yeah, he he was as physically dominant as anybody I've ever seen play football. So, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, two professional guys in professional I mean, sports. It's about not right bad a, a couple of guys our age that have seen uh, certainly some, at least yourself, seen a couple mm-hmm. of professionals. I know Justin Brantos was talking about his highlights with, uh, <laughs> with as he's in the window trying to make me laugh. Mm-hmm. He was going over his highlights with uh, Alec Brown and, uh, there was one of the most nonchalant blocks I've ever seen. It literally just literally mm-hmm. put his arm up, and it was enough. No further effort required. Uh, but certainly a, a very memorable athlete as he'll try to. He had uh, a nice growth spurt from like his freshman to his sophomore. What's the shortest you saw Alec Brown? I, I, he was like a slightly tall. Like I'm six one. He was when I first remember meeting. Well, I knew him since he was really young. Like because I, I, I seen his bro. Like I, I hung. A, like around his bro- brother by proxy sometimes oh, okay. like he was like i knew him since he was younger and then he, he got up like in high school he was like at the beginning he was like maybe sh- as tall as me a little taller and then all of a sudden just shot off full <laughs> foot okay <laughs> that'll that'll do it yeah and he was uh and then after that it's like he just he was already naturally gifted and the, the height just helped and he he knew what to do it's that that's the more gifted big men they kind of turn from they're shorter guys, like and they had, to, they, had to, they had to play short, and then all of a sudden you shoot up, and that's just the best way. It's better than being big right away, and, and not because most co- most coaches, well, most coaches will pigeonhole you too. They'll oh, be like, true. they'll be like, all right, you're going down low, and you're staying there, instead of you know trying to just help their overall game because they're they're only coaching for right now and this season in terms of not looking too much at their future. But yeah. Well, uh, Jeff, do you have anything uh, else you would like to promote, plug, anything of that nature? Um, uh, I go to the races every Mississippi Thunder Speedway every Friday, and I write stuff from there, and if they appear in Saturday's paper. I might have another article in terms of the week, like just kind of a fall, like a fallout from what happened or whatever. Okay. They just said their big River City Rumble this weekend, and that was fun to be at. It was, it was probably about 2,500 people there. That well, was, hey, uh, we'll have you back on and uh, talk a little bit about that. Certainly some more local-oriented, but uh, as it's mm-hmm. the middle of July, local athletics are at a premium. I so. would say uh, wait till September. We're going to we'll probably be full of local athletics at uh, that point. <laughs> well, certainly a friend of the podcast and going to be an on, ongoing uh, reoccurring guest if he mm-hmm. wants to, that is, uh, Jeff Tice. Mm-hmm. And a reminder to tune into the Sports Buzz. And uh, one more thing I'd like to promote. Uh, you heard me mentioning uh, some of the highlight film. If you have uh, what you think is a noteworthy highlight film, feel free to uh, send it in. You can find me on Twitter at Ty Schwartz. Otherwise, uh, send an email to HBCI. Uh, uh, there's no email that I'm going to read. HBCI.com backslash sports. Get in touch with us. But uh, upcoming, we may have a little bit of a highlight, uh, battle of the highlight tapes. See uh, who is the most dominant athlete in the area. So uh, for another episode, that's going to do it. I'm Ty Schwartzel. Thank you for listening.